After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all the people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you have set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, Go through the camp and tell the people, Get your supplies ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. May God bless uh, this reading of his word. Uh, from the, the book of Joshua, we're going to be, be doing some studies on uh, God's road to success. And you might have noticed in the passage it mentioned the word success. And we're going to look at God's road to success uh, and how to find it. So just go to the next slide. Now from the scripture reading we just had, all right, you have to take the next slide. Uh, after the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Okay. Moses had died. And on this next slide, we're going to see that after the death of Moses, Joshua was to fill his shoes. Now these were some really big shoes to fill. Right? Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that circumstance where you're following someone who was really great. All right? I did it. I took a church down in Ohio, and the pastor before me, his name was Jim Greer. Now, Pastor Greer was a profound theologian. He was a scholar of scholars. And he packed out the church with college students uh, who we call Greerites. They call them Greerites. And no matter what I said, it would be after the service. Well, you know what Dr. Greer said? And, and you know, it was like, how do you fill the shoes of someone great? Well, it, it took a while, but uh, finally, you know, over enough time, they forgot about him. And, and there were less and less of the, the Greerite sayings and, and, and more of them getting into it. This, this is the circumstances that Joshua finds himself in. He's got to fill some big shoes. Not only does he have to fill some big shoes, but he's got to cross the river to go into the promised land and take it. Cross into the land, he says, that I'm about to give you, as I promised Moses. And see, there it happens. The name Moses pops up again. You see, he, he's going to always be filling in the shoes uh, of Moses, the great man of God, who gave us the first five books of the Old Testament, the same size as the entire New Testament. But God had promised the land. Moses, because of his unbelief, was not allowed to go into the land. But he died at Mount Nemo. The Lord buried him. And it was Joshua who's taken him in. And he's to do this in faith and belief that God had promised them the land. Not only did he promise them the land, but he promised them a victory. No one will be able to stand up against you. You're going to be victorious. I like that, don't you? All the days of your life, you're going to have victory. Great promised victory. Then there's a promised presence. As I was with Moses. There he comes up again, Moses. So I will be with you. I will never leave you 
nor forsake you. That verse is picked up in Hebrews chapter 13 and is applied to the first century Christians. As God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I want to see that this is success. Success happens when God is with you. Back in the 14th century BC, the first century, or in the future, 21st century in which we live, success is found when God is with you. When God is with you. When God is with you. Now, if I could guarantee you success in your life today, absolutely guarantee it, would you do what it takes? All right, now that's a yes or no question, all right? So you either say yes or no. Some of you are saying, well, I don't know. You haven't told me what it takes yet. <laughs> but if I can guarantee you, let me add that. If I could guarantee you God's success in your life today, would you do what it takes? Give yourself an answer there. Would you do what it takes? So what can you do to find success? That's the question. What can you do to find success? Well, I think there's an answer in our text he said several times, I hope you noticed this when I read through the passage. He said, be strong and courageous, verse 6. He said, be strong and very courageous, verse 7. He said, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. God wants you to be strong and courageous. You know how you get strong? You work out. If you don't exercise, you go into atrophy. I mean, you, you lose. You lose your tone. So what do you got to do? You got to exercise. But what are you talking about here? He's talking about here exercising your faith. And so God's going to bring things into your life, difficulties, problems, trials, so that you have to exercise faith in Him to become strong and you become courageous. Now, if you've been working out, okay, and, and then there's something that, you know, like you have to open up and, and it just won't give, and, and, and you, if you haven't been working out, you're, you're trying to open it, and you finally say, I can't get that. And you see somebody really strong and say, hey, uh, you think you could open that for me? And he looks at the, the, the little jar and, you know, this bulk, bulky buff body says, no sweat. He's got all the confidence in the world. He, he's not discouraged. He's got courage. He goes over and opens it right up. Because he is strong and courageous. Now what is, notice what it says. If you're going to be strong and courageous, it do not be terrified. Why would he put that in there? Do not be terrified. Well, they're about to go into a land that 40 years earlier, they sent 12 spies into the land to check it out. And they came back and they said, oh my goodness, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. There's all kinds of prosperity. They brought back a cluster of grapes that took two men to carry. And they said, whoa, this place is just a place of blessing. But there's giants there. They have strong walled cities, 40 feet high actually. And so they have these strong cities. And he said, we can't take them. And they became very terrified because of the size of the opposition. You ever been terrified? They're really scared. He says, don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And the question is, why? Why not? Here they look at themselves. They said to them, when they said to Moses Rich, they said, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. <laughs> These must have been some pretty big people. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. Why? Why? Here's why. I go to the New Testament. It says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. When I got saved at eight years old, I didn't know what all happened to me. At that time, I just thought, man, I accepted Jesus, I'm not going to go to hell. I was pretty simple. I have eternal life. I'll live forever with God forever because I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Little did I know that he gave me the spirit. And the spirit is a spirit not of fear. The Holy Spirit has not given me, what he brought in my life is not a fear. He said, but just the opposite. Here's the opposite of being afraid. The spirit of power, the spirit of love, the spirit of a sound mind. This is really important. Because fear is the opposite of each three of, of those items. When you're afraid, it's because you are powerless. At least that's what you feel. The Israelites 
were afraid and terrified because they were giants and were grasshoppers. They felt powerless in the presence of these, this enemy. Now, most of us aren't going out to battle against giants and, and that kind of thing. But we have other kinds of giants in our life. Maybe it's a gigantic bill that has come in. And you say to yourself, I don't know how in the world I'm going to pay it. Maybe it's a gigantic health issue. And you say, I just don't know how I'm ever going to get past this. Maybe it's a gigantic relationship problem. In your marriage with one of your kids or someone, and it's just, it's, it's gigantic. It's been there for a long time, and it, would just, it, it just won't move, it won't budge. And so I got this thing, and I feel so powerless. What's the use? I want to give up. I want to give up on my marriage. I want to give up on my kids. I want to give up. You name it. You want to give up, you just you feel so powerless. I can't do anything to change it. That's a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power. And when you're looking at a gigantic problem in your life that you can't overcome, you have to say, well, God has given me the spirit of power. Notice the second one is the spirit of love. When you're afraid, the first thing you do is you go, oh, me, woe is me. Poor me. Nobody's got as bad as me. You, you see, the opposite of love, because love is self-sacrificing. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave. The number one thing in love is that you are self-sacrificing. You give for someone else. When you're afraid, you're no longer focused on others. You're not only focused on yourself. You are self-absorbed. You feel powerless. Poor me. I'm self-absorbed. And then the next one is sound mind. When you're afraid, you don't have a sound mind. I call it the hypothetical what-if mind. All right? Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And you go down a path, and it's usually the negative path of the worst-case scenario. What if this happens, that happens, or the other thing happens? And nothing has happened yet. And suppose you, you know, you, you've been to the doctor, and uh, you're supposed to get a report back, and you didn't get the phone call fast enough, and you're listening to your message, and as the message comes in, the doctor's office says, oh, listen, your tests are back, uh, but uh, you'll have to call us to get the results. And you think to yourself, here we go. What if they found that I've got cancer? What if they say it's an untreatable? What if it's too far to do any? What if? And your mind goes down this what if scenario, right? There's nothing logical about this. So that when you finally do call, they say, oh yeah, we got your test back, and you're just fine. But where has your mind gone? You see, God has not given us. God, that, that, that doesn't come from Him. What God gives us is power, love, and a sound mind. Now, imagine for a moment, I mean, imagine for a moment that you are a parent and your, your house is on fire. And the logical thing for you to do is have a good fear of the fire and get out, right? Be afraid of fire. I mean, I, I give all the credit in the world to firemen. Because these guys rush in where the more, no more normal person says you rush out. Okay? So the house on fire to you. You, you, you out of fear, you run out. Okay? And then while you're outside, you hear the voice of a baby crying. You thought, oh, well, they got your son or your granddaughter out. But no, the other family members did. The baby's still in the house. So what do you do? Because you're now not so self-absorbed. You want to do what is totally irrational in any other circumstance and run into the house because it's on fire, right? And so you're going to run in to rescue the baby because why? Now you've got a sound mind. What was considered irrational before is now sound because you don't have your own interest in you. You've got the interest of the other person in you. You're in love. And so what do you do? You had a surge of adrenaline rush. It gives you the power to go in and do it. See, that's just the opposite of being afraid. God has given us what it takes to be strong and courageous and to be not afraid, nor to become discouraged. He goes out and says, where will you find the success? Where are you going to find God's kind of success? I notice that the text that says this, in the land. It repeats it. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you. You go down to verse 6. You will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore. About to give, I swore this land to your forefathers. It's the land. He goes out and he says, go into the, take possession of the land. It's the land, I'm telling you. That's, that's, that's where you're going to find success. 
You go down a little bit further, verse 13, he says, remember the Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. And then he goes on and he says in verse 13, stay in the land. There's something about the land. The land is where God wanted them. They're, that's where God wanted them. God wanted them in that specific land. The land here it is, you can almost say, is in the place of the concept of the will of God. God had a specific location. He drew out the boundary. I want Israel there. And God had a plan for Israel to bless them in that land. And the land represents here the will of God. You see, God has a will for each one of our lives. God wants each one of us to be something that He has designed for you and you alone. There is a place for you in His will. He has a plan for your life. In His will, like the land for them, you get ready to do it. How do you get ready to do it? We're going to find it. It's in the Word of God. You've got to know the Word. He swore to the forefathers the land. He has revealed to us His will in the Word. The Word tells us what God wants. They were to take possession of it. Now that meant they had to go in and they were going to fight opposition. They are going to battle. They are going to conquer it. When you decide that you're going to do God's will, you're going to find opposition. You're going to find battle. There's going to be spiritual warfare. There's going to be all these things going on. But you have to take possession of it. When God assigns you what you are to do, then you go in the land and you rest in the land. You find God's will and you go in it. Oh, finally, you're there and you rest in the land. And then what it is that God has for you, you stay with it. You don't leave it. When I was younger, there was a man in our church, the Green Baptist Church, named Stan Lightfoot. Stan Lightfoot was as active a church member as you would find anywhere. Sold out to the Lord. Um, later, we were talking. And, uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, Dennis, I was getting so involved in church because I knew that God wanted me somewhere else. And I felt that if I would just get so involved in church, that would be fine. He said, God had called me to the ministry, but I, I, I didn't want to yield to go to the ministry. So I got involved in the church, the local church. It was a good thing. He did a lot of things in church. He said, but finally I had to quit my job, go to a fast-track Bible college, and he went on to start several churches. With high wealth of Baptist mission. He knew deep down inside that he wasn't where God wanted him to be. I can't tell you where God wants you to be. I know where God wants me to be. Only you and God know where you need to be. And you've got to get ready for it. He'll reveal it to you. And then you've got to take possession of it. You have to rest in it. You have to stay in it where God wants you to be. That's where you're going to find success. How will you find success? The answer is very, very clear. Obey the word. I mean, it does not get any clearer with this. Verse 7 says, be careful to obey the law. Now, the law is a reference to the Torah. At the point that Joshua is in his life, this is the Bible. That's all there is. There's only the first five books of the Bible. Okay? The Torah. And so he said, be careful to obey the Bible, the law. God wants us to be the people of the book. You know, I have a lot of scripture in my messages. You probably say, oh yeah, you do. That's because God wants us to be a people of the book. He wants us to know it. This, this is where I find God's will. This is where I discover what he wants for my life. His spirit bears witness with my spirit what he wants applied to my life from the word of God. He said, you have to obey the, you have to obey the word. Now, I notice also it said, be careful to obey the word. All right? Uh, I'm a typical guy. So, uh, you know, I, I get something that's got to be put together. I look at the picture and say, I don't need the instructions. Then I start to put it together. Uh, how many guys have done that? <laughs> the hard job, right? And then you find you got a couple pieces left over, and you say, okay, maybe now it's time to find the instructions, right? 
That was not carefully obeying the instruction manual. Right here in the second. All right. Now, my brother, Dave, he was a body repairman. He used to say, you know, when he was done, if he had any leftover pieces, he always threw them under the seat so he could always say to the customer, every, every piece that came out, it went back in it. <laughs> Not necessarily in the right spot, but it went back in it. <laughs> but some of us, we treat the Bible like this. We treat God's Word like this. You know, I can live my life without it, and then my life gets all messed up, and we're off track. We say, wait a minute, what, what did it say? Hey, preacher, can you help me? You got a verse for me? You bail me out here? You see what I'm saying? The person who has success, God's success in his life, carefully, he checks and double checks before he makes the decision to do what he's going to do. Is this what God wants in my life? Carefully obey. It's not pick and choose. Pick and choose. You don't pick one part or another. You know, you probably heard about the guy that was wanting to know God's will. He opened up the Bible and found a spot. It said, uh, Judas went out and hung himself. Ooh. So well, maybe, maybe uh, that's not for me. Turn the page. It comes about and he says, uh, um, uh, go and do likewise. <laughs> I still don't like that. Flips the pages. Uh, what thou dost do quickly. I mean, that's not the way you find out what God wants for your life. But if you're consistently, and that's why we often go through a whole book, we try to find its context. In fact, what is it that God is saying here? And we apply it in context. I don't choose what I like and skip over what I don't like. There's a lot in this book that is politically incorrect today. My question is, who do you prefer to obey? Government or God? I obey God. The talking heads on TV? Or God? Oh, God. You know, I don't pick and choose. I accept it all as being inspired of God, the God breathed writings. I go a little bit further, he says, no detours, don't turn from it to the right or the left. It's not like, okay, on Sunday I go by the book. Monday, Tuesday, well, I make a little departure here. I don't have to live this out in my life. No, no, don't, don't take any detours. Make sure it's consistently there in your life every day. Do not turn from it to the right or the left. Do not let the book depart from your mouth. I find that so fascinating. He didn't say from your eyes like you're reading it. He didn't say your ears like you're listening to it. He said, but your mouth, because you're speaking it. Often uh, during the day, you quote a verse. Do you articulate a biblical principle? Do you tell someone else about the Lord Jesus? Do you share your faith? You see, talk about it. You talk about it with your kids. It tells us in Deuteronomy 6. You talk about it with your kids when they wake up, when they go to bed, uh, when they come into the house, when they leave the house, when you're on the pathway. You, you talk about it. Do you have a Jesus vocabulary? Do you have a God talk where you talk about God in your life? Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth because you're speaking it. And then he goes out and says, memorize it. Meditate on it day and night. I don't know how you memorize, but that's how I memorize. I have to repeat it, reread it, go over it and over it. And I find the modern translations are much harder to memorize than the old King James. Because the old King James is so different, it's easy to remember. I worked for a long time on memorizing passages. And I'm sure, still not sure they get it. from our Galatians series we just did. It says, uh, walk in the spirit, you will not gratify the, the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, the spirit which is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want to do. There he goes. He said, walk in the Spirit. That won't happen. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll rely on the Spirit. So when I'm having conflict in my life, I quote that verse and say, walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. I, it's only because i got it memorized. I put it in my brain. He said, meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do everything that's written in it. It's not about just knowing it. It's about doing it.
Remember James said, don't be a hearer of the word only, but be a doer of the word. Don't be like the guy that looks in the glass, you know, the mirror, and he sees himself, he thinks to himself, you know. Don't be like the guy that sees himself in the mirror and says, oh, so what? Walks away and doesn't care. This is the mirror. We read it here and it reflects who we are. He said, then make the necessary changes so that your life is changed by what the word says. And then we have this. Realize it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. How do you find success? You get in the book. Why will you find success? God will be with you. God will be with you. He says that you may be successful. That you'll be prosperous and successful. Verse 7 and 8. Then I, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you. Where do you go? I want to suggest to you, anytime the Lord is with you, you're on the winning side. Anytime the Lord is with you, you're on the winning side. I used to say, you know, um, one plus God is a majority, and I come to the conclusion, but no, just God is a majority. So it's just, I need to get with him. I need to get with him. And it's, he's laying out here that the first chapter is all about success. So I asked you this at, at, at the beginning of the message. I said, if I could guarantee God's success in your life today, would you do what it takes? That was a simple question. Yes or no? For some of you said, oh, I don't know what I told you we got to do. If I could guarantee God's success in your life, would you do what it takes? So my answer to it, if you said yes, so do what it takes. Be strong. Be strong in your faith. Be strong. Don't waver, don't doubt. Hold out to his word. Be strong. Be fearless in your faith. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. The harder you work out, the more resistance you have, the stronger you become. You don't get strong pulling on rubber bands. <laughs> you pull on those really tough loaded springs and then you're strong. Be strong and fearless in your faith with courage. Be in God's will. Ask God, where do you want me to be? What is it that you want to accomplish with my life? What is the plan that you have for my life? Be obedient to the Word. To do that, you've got to get in the Word. So I put in the bulletin. Okay, you probably noticed I put in the bulletin a Bible reading guide. Now, some of you have started at the beginning of the year, and you're reading all the way through the Bible, and a number of you are even on course, and you're ahead. Some of us uh, have uh, fallen by the wayside. <laughs> so I've got a real easy plan here. This is just the New Testament. It's a 90-day plan. A 90-day plan. And, and so between now and the end of the year, you have plenty of time. You can take a couple of days off even. And still read through the entire New Testament by just reading three chapters a day. Three chapters a day. Why? God will make you a success. God will prosper you. I won't. God will. It's in His Word. This is the Word of God. It is His promise, not mine. You just take that every day, check it off. I've read, I've read, I've read. This is easy. Three, three chapters a day. Probably for most of your readers, 15 minutes or less. 15 minutes or less. They have God. Success brought into your life. The ladies have a woman's Bible study going on called the Armor of God doing spiritual battle. Joshua's doing physical and spiritual battle, as we'll see as time goes on. You can join the Bible study. It's not too late. Join in the Bible study. Get in the Word. Let the Word get into you. Uh, tonight we're beginning living uh, a Jesus built life. You want, want to have Jesus building in your life? We're, we're going to go over. Build Jesus Build Life. We want to become a Jesus Build Church, and the church is made up of people. I want to invite you to be here, you know, 6.30 to 9, uh, so that we can study for, for an hour and a half. And we'll just look at, at the Jesus Build Life. 
It's a no homework. You just come and you fill in the blanks and the, the notebooks that we prepared and, and, and we'll just study so that you can get God's success going in your life. You see, when you're strong, you're fearless, you're in God's will, you're obedient to the, the word, God will be with you. Actually, you catch up with God. That equals success. That equals success. If I could guarantee it, this is what you do. Would you do it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, your word is a word that pierces even to the dividing between the, so the joint marrow and the discerner of thoughts in our minds. You, you cut right through it all. Today, you're speaking to hearts here, saying, I need God's success in my life. I'm going to plug in to you, O Lord. I will be strong and courageous. I won't be afraid. I'm going to be in your word. So, Lord, that I can see your prosperity and your success in my life. So that I can overcome formidable foes and gigantic problems. Just as you're going to see, Joshua did with your help in his day. You're going to do the same thing all over again in our day. Help us, O oh God. Embolden us to be courageous and fearless. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Paraphrasing that. Scripture Paul in Romans. If God is with us, then what could possibly stand against us? Our God is greater. Our God is higher than anything else. Let's stand and sing together.
Aristobulus, a little band of 12 disciples. 12 disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, like they was, that was a scum of the earth. And God used them to turn the world upside down. If our God is for us, you know, we need to be for him. We need to be in his word, we need to be in prayer, we need to be in fellowship with God's people, there's so much. And, and then, if our God is with us, who would stop us? Father in heaven, we all seek to be in your will. We want to be in your word. We want to be in fellowship and harmony with you. We want to, ex we want to experience the power of God. You said that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. We want to experience the power of God. Jesus said, greater works than I have done, you will do. Lord, we want to do those greater works. We want your power. We want your presence. We want a relationship with you. Bless us, O oh God. Empower us as your people. As we draw near unto you. You said, if we just humble ourselves before you, lift us up as we humble ourselves. Before the word of God, lift us up, Lord. Dismiss us with your blessing, Lord. As we stay around for the fellowship, bless the food to us and our fellowship. May we encourage one another. May the words of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God, be on our lips so that we have Jesus talk and God talk. And Lord, not just all the mundane things of this world. May we might give praise and glory to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name.